Welcome to the Washington Heights Church Podcast. We're so glad you're here. Each week, we bring you the latest Sunday message filled with God's Word to help strengthen your faith and deepen your walk with Christ. Whether you're tuning in from home, your commute, or anywhere in between, we're thrilled to have you join our community. So grab a cup of coffee, find a cozy spot, and let's get started. Are you ready, Washington Heights? Yeah, we're going to be for the next number of weeks in a book in the Bible that is in, entirely dedicated to love, romance, dating, marriage, and sex. Aren't you excited? Now, one thing, I, okay, we got one guy, awesome. That's, <laughs> thanks, Kip. Uh, I uh, want to just give a little bit of a preview, you know, to parents, if you are parents and you have kids in this room, um, you know, we're going to be kind of PG-13 here over the next number of weeks, and we just want to give you that heads up so you can make the best decision for your kids, and if you don't want them in here, um, in children's ministry, they're not going to be talking about those same things here, um, but let me also say this, that in our day, if your kids are able to understand the words that we're going to talk about, and we're never going to be inappropriate, um, but if they understand what those words are, I guarantee you, they're already getting some input about these parts of life, and how good would it be if the Bible kind of weighed in on that as well? So I'll just throw that out there, but you make the best decision for you and for your kids. So a couple other introductory things. I really believe that there's something for everyone in this series, whether you're single, whether you're married, you're single again. I think sometimes when we talk about this stuff, people you know, might say, well, that's for somebody else. Um, there is truly something here for everyone. And we also recognize, you know, in our day that the times they are a change in, as Bob Dylan said a long, long time ago. And five years ago, and maybe, and definitely 10 years ago, um, there were phrases and words like toxic masculinity and gender fluidity that weren't even a part of our dialogue, but they are now. And so what does it mean to be a man and to be a woman in a day like this that follows God and honors God and invites God into the whole romantic life and marriage life and all that comes along with it? Yeah, this week we're going to be talking about um, being a man. And next week, I'm going to be talking about being a woman. And no, I've never been a woman and never have been there. Um, so what gives you the right to talk about that? Because here, just so you know, uh, in case, you know, we haven't said this already, we really view the Bible as our authority and the Bible speaks to that. So we're just going to try to unpack what the Bible says and put it out there for all of us um, so that we can understand the direction in which God has taken us. Another thing to say up front, um, we're going to interpret the book of Song of Solomon literally through the um, centuries of the church. There have been some people maybe a little bit uncomfortable talking about um, sexuality. Uh, who have viewed this metaphorically and translated allegorically. And so it's kind of like God's love for the nation of Israel or Jesus' love for the church. That would make it really weird in some sections where it's talking about things that just seem like it's two people in a relationship with each other. So we're going to talk about this literally, uh, the way that I think it was intended to be. And I'll just say this, if you're bought into the whole um, dating, romance, love thing in our culture, you might be offended along the way, um, just to give you a heads up with that. And what I mean by that is if you're kind of in a culture where it's meet up, hook up, shack up, break up, meet up, hook up, shack up, break up, and kind of over and over again, you're kind of a serial dater, um, you're going to be offended along the way here. Um, but know that there's a heart of God behind this that's trying to lead us toward life. So the book of Song of Solomon is a little bit different than a lot of the other books in the Bible. Um, you know, some books say, well, this happened, this happened, then he said this, and she said this. Um, this is in the category of wisdom literature. So it's written a little bit more poetically, and it's actually songs that are being sung back and forth. And there's a guy, and he's King Solomon, and there's a woman, we don't get her name, but she's called the Shulamite woman. And she also has some friends who weigh in on occasion, and God even weighs in on one occasion. Get this, when does God speak? He speaks on the honeymoon, praise God. Um, that there is all of those aspects that are happening in this relationship. So this is going to be kind of like Les Mis or Hamilton, where people are singing these lyrics to each other. And there's a lot of imagery here that we need to unpack. And so with all of that, are you ready to jump in to the Song of Solomon? Let's begin with a verse 
that I'm going to invite my wife Sally to memorize in four different versions. And it goes <laughs> something like this. Let him kiss me with the kisses of his mouth. Praise God. For your love is more delightful than wine. Now here's something right up front. What you're going to discover in the relationship that you see play out between this man and this woman is not that one of them is playing offense trying to score and the other one's playing defense trying to ward this off. What you find is a relationship of mutual attraction. And yes, attraction was created by God. And mutual respect and mutual growth in their relationship with each other. And for them to speak in flirting kind of ways to each other is in the context of this relationship that at this point is a dating relationship and is taking them somewhere. Because dating is a process, it's not a status, and it's there for a purpose, a reason that is helpful to ultimately establish, is this someone to whom I can commit myself for the rest of my days, and as it's described later in the New Testament, that I would even be willing to lay down my life for them. And so they're in that kind of relationship. And yeah, in the middle of that, they talk to each other in flirting kind of ways. And then she goes on and she says, pleasing is a fragrance of your perfumes. Your name is like perfume poured out. Now what's she talking about there? Sometimes in the Bible, it talks about your name. And even when we pray, a lot of times, right, we'll pray this way. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. Does that mean that we insert Jesus' name there and it's just sort of this perfunctory thing where we check off that box? Certainly we do include Jesus' name, but it means a whole lot more than that. To pray according to Jesus' name and, and for somebody's name to be out there talks about who they are in reality. It talks about their heart, their will, their desires, their intention. It really is a sum total of all that they are. It's talking about the character and nature of someone. And so she looks at him. What is the first thing that she talks about? Is it the fact that he looks hot, that he's really buff? about what he drives, about where he lives, about what he does for a living. No, the first thing that she talks about is his character. And I think in our day, we're easily tempted in a different direction to put character maybe down after some other, you know, things that we might deem are really important. But this is a call. What does it mean to be a man in this day and in the entire relational pie to factor into the one slice of love and romance and somebody with whom I'm in a process? What does it mean? It means to build godly character. To build godly character. When it talks about your name is like perfume that is poured out, that is a refined perfume and refined oil. And many times in those days when perfumes were first gathered, there was all kinds of stuff mixed in there together. And before it became something that you could pour out and people would use it, they would extract all the impurities from it. And so the picture here is your name, your character, that there has been an extraction of some of the impurities that are there. This is somebody who has been building their character in a positive direction. Can you and I do that on our own? Certainly we can to some degree, right? Um, but here's the thing. There's a God who longs to not only invite us into a relationship with him, but inside of that relationship, he promises to unleash the power of God so that these hearts of ours can be renovated and changed. See, there's a condition that we all come into this world with. It's a condition called sin. And that doesn't mean that we're as horrible as we could possibly be. What it does mean is try as hard as we might. We just can't rein it all in and get it all right. We don't even live up to our own standards, much less God's standards. And do you want proof of that? Head into the nursery right now. And go check out the kids, your kids that are in there. And they're fighting over toys that don't belong to any of them. Right, and they're sounding like the seagulls in Finding Nemo. Mine, 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 it doesn't belong to any of you. <laughs> and here's a question for all you parents. Did you put that in there? No, you're like, it was already there. It came with the original equipment. <laughs> and all of us come into this world with that original equipment and we get a little bit more refined as we get older. But you know what? That's the reality of who we are. And we need the presence of a holy and powerful God to show up to begin to renovate these hearts and lives of ours. And by the way, along this, you know, same line of character, you know, one of the things the Bible talks about, you know, when we're dating, we're not dating for fun, right? We're not dating um, to have friends with benefits. 
We're dating in a process that will ultimately lead us to a commitment of one man and one woman in a covenant relationship called marriage. And so what that means is that we're committing ourselves to that process. And also in the Bible, we're called that we are not to be unequally yoked. And you know what that means? That means a follower of Jesus um, should not intend to get married to somebody who's not. And that's not a better than, worse than kind of thing. It's just a reality that there is a spiritual place in which we find ourselves and to have somebody who is not on that same plane will inevitably um, cause issues, dynamics in that relationship to unfold. And so we're called to find somebody who has also made the same commitment to Jesus. Now, if you're in that situation where you say, well, I didn't know about that at the time, or one of us became a follower and one didn't, is that God's call for me to bail on that relationship? No, it's not. And we're called all things being equal to be in that relationship and to follow God to the best of our ability in that relationship. But the first call here is to build godly character. And then it goes on, no wonder the young women love you. Now she's talking about her friends. Take me away with you, let us hurry, let the king bring me um, into his chambers. And so she has people who know her and understand her, and apparently they also know something about him, and they're standing at a distance or close up, and they're saying, you know what, we approve of this, we see this relationship um, being a benefit to you, and this bringing out some of the best in you. One of the indicators of a relationship, if we want to get a little bit of a bearing about that, is the feedback from the people that know you, that care about you, that love you. And maybe one of the best, you know, indicators of that is your parents. Nobody loves you like your parents do. In fact, you know, when Sally and I were first dating, you know, shortly before they elect invented electricity, um, <laughs> she met my parents for the first time and they talked, you know, there for a while and, and all of that and phone calls and all that kind of thing. And in one of those phone calls, you know, it was basically kind of this, you know, you better marry her. And I'm like, well, you know, that's kind of the direction I think in which is going. Yeah, you better, because if you break up, we're keeping her and we're getting rid of you. <laughs> Your parents are a real good indicator because they know you like nobody else and they care about you. And her friends who know her um, are applauding this and saying this relationship is good. We rejoice and delight in you. We will praise your love more than wine. And then she says, how right they are to adore you. And he's ta she's talking now to him. And what she's talking about is his reputation. And reputation is not the same as image, right? Image is something we can create and maybe something we can massage and we can maintain. But she's talking about his reputation of who we know you to be, the sum total of your decisions and your character up until this point in time. And the friends are saying, this is great. By contrast, it may be your friends are indicating that you might want to rethink this. That's something to pay attention to. Let's say you're a young lady and you say, hey, I met this guy and we had a great conversation. And then he asked me out and we're going to go to the music festival and do this thing and that thing and the other thing. And they go, oh, well, that's great. What's his name? And when they say the name and they go, oh, no. <laughs> do you have social media? Have you seen the wreckage of relationships that he's leaving in his wake? That's something to pay attention to. Earn a good reputation. Not an image, but who you really are in real life. This is um, something we're going to unpack here in the next um, week here. Um, but she begins to sing once again. Dark am I, yet lovely daughters of Jerusalem. Dark like the tents of Kedar, like the tent curtains of Solomon. Do not stare at me because I am dark, because I am darkened by the sun. My mother's sons are angry with me and made me take care of the vineyards, my own vineyard. I had to neglect what's going on there. Um, realize back in the Old Testament 3,000 years ago when this was written, um, people who were doing really well um, were plump and lighter in color. Why? Because they had enough to eat and they didn't have to go work out in the sun. But she does. And so she's expressing some insecurities about the way that she looks. And you know what? We didn't come from a lot and I had to go to work. And so to be tan and buff like in our day, that was actually not something attractive back in the day. It's amazing how those things of attraction and cultures and times um, change. 
Tell me, you whom I love, where you graze your flock and where you rest your sheep at midday. Why should I be like the veiled women beside the flock of your friends? And if you do not know, most beautiful of women, follow the tracks of the sheep and graze your young goats by the tents of the shepherd. What's she talking about? She is trying to arrange her schedule so that her paths cross with the guy to whom she's attracted. She's saying, King Solomon, I got some sheep to graze. And I understand you got some fields and some wells where they, you know, can flourish. Is it okay if I bring my sheep to your fields and let them graze there? And what do you know? Maybe we'll cross paths. And he's like, yep, I'll see you. I'll be at Starbucks at noon. Stop by. We'll talk. The sheep will graze and we'll be in good shape. So maybe you're a single person here at Washington Heights. And maybe you see somebody who looks like he's perfume uh, poured out. And uh, you think... (laughs) That's somebody, you know, that I might be interested in getting to know a little bit more of. And so if you put yourself in their past, maybe by serving in the same arena they do, you would be following this in a more modern context here, but they're trying um, to have their paths cross. Then he says, I liken you, my darling, to a mare among Pharaoh's chariot horses. Now this needs some explanation. (laughs) So guys, before you go home and call your wife Seabiscuit, hang on for a second, okay? (laughs) Hey, why the long face? Uh, don't, don't do that without understanding what this is. This is an incredibly high compliment. Because in the ancient world, and I still think today, you know, out of all the animals, horses are beautiful. They are strong. And in the known world at the time, the person who owned the best horses was in Egypt. And it was Pharaoh. And they would breed and they tried, you know, to create, you know, the strongest lines of horses. And then out of all the horses that were available, Pharaoh could go out and he could take his pick. And he says, I'm picking that horse to lead my procession. And so what this guy is saying to her is out of all the women, you are the most beautiful to me. You are of the greatest value to me. This is an incredibly high value compliment and he consistently speaks kindly to her. Humanly speaking, when you make the commitment to say I do and you become husband and wife, that is your most important human relationship. And guys, she's more important than your dumb friends. And let's face it, all our friends are dumb. And she's more important than our dumb hobbies. That doesn't mean that doesn't include some other things but we need to find ways to communicate value to her. And that is what he is doing in this section. I liken you, my darling, to a mare among Pharaoh's chariots. Your cheeks are beautiful with earrings, your neck with strings of jewels. We will make you earrings of gold and studded with silver. He's got his hot blue gun out. He's bedazzling her some earrings here. (laughs) And just saying, you know, I'm just, just trying to respond to what I see in front of me. And that is an incredibly... Um, beautiful person to whom you have the highest value out of anyone. So guys, find ways to communicate value to her. And I think one of the important things that happens here for guys like us that are married is sometimes guys can treat the whole dating and getting to marriage thing like they treat hunting. Here's what I mean, right? We put on the right gear and we smell the way we're supposed to smell and then we start stalking our prey and we get to that point and they say I do and then we mount it and we put it on the wall and we never look at it again you know for the rest of our lives it's just up there but it's like check you know got that accomplished what you're going to find not only on this side of the relationship where they're still dating but on the other side is that he continues to pursue her Way back in the book of Genesis at the beginning, Adam is placed in a garden and God gives him this direction to subdue and cultivate. And I think for guys, a lot of times, you know what comes a little more easily? Subduing. Cultivating is harder. And cultivating is ongoing. The apostle Peter in the New Testament says this, husbands live with your wives in an understanding way. And what that means is to continue to uncover and discover and bring out what is in her heart and soul and all the good intentions that she has within her. One great way to do this, um, there's a book that's been around for a long time. Uh, If you've never heard about it, it's called The Five Love Languages. And the premise of the book is we all have this love tank and they get filled in different ways. Not everybody's exactly the same. 
And the five love languages, um, and we're called to speak them to one another, and I'll see if I can remember them off the top of my head. So there's gifts like he's doing here. Um, There's physical touch, quality time, words of encouragement, and acts of service. Do you know what your wife, and really for anybody, do you know what your spouse's love language is? Because we may think, hey, the love language that I have, let's say it's gifts, you know, because that's what's happening here. Well, that's what everybody must want, right? Because that's what I want. But maybe if the guy's love language is gifts and she's wondering, hey, if you love me, maybe that would look more like emptying the dishwasher (laughs) or doing some mopping because my love language is acts of service. And so there's an opportunity for us to learn and to grow and discover what it is that will speak into that love tank of the person to whom we belong. Communicate value to her. Then she goes on, while the king was at his table, my perfume spread its fragrance. My beloved is to me a sachet of myrrh resting between my breasts. My beloved is to me a cluster of henna blossoms from the vineyards of Engedi. What is that talking about? Engedi is this tiny little oasis right on the shores of the Dead Sea in the middle of a place where nothing is growing. But then there's this little oasis. David in the Old Testament, when he was on the run from King Saul, he went to En Gedi and there he found rest, refreshment, encouragement, nourishment. And what she's saying is when you, King, walk into the room, you know what comes with you? En Gedi. Rest, peace, refreshment. And so guys, when you walk in the room, what walks in with you? And I think it's easy for us, you know, to maybe view that through our own eyes. Um, But what is it that you bring with you? How are you cultivating moments in life when you walk into the room? He responds, how beautiful you are, my darling. Oh, how beautiful your eyes are doves. Where is his focus right now? It's on her eyes. Anybody grow up with a song called Head, Shoulders, Knees and Toes, Knees and Toes? Anybody familiar with that? Now, there's a whole chapter again on the honeymoon when they have said I do to each other. And pretty much everything that happens there is between the shoulders and the knees, if you know what I mean. But right now, his focus is not there. It's from the shoulders upward. And he has his eyes locked with her eyes. Here's the takeaway from that. He is not viewing her as a commodity. She is not a thing for him to see what he can get but he is there to understand who she is and to grow some depth into their relationship with each other. And it is so easy for us to view somebody else as a commodity, not somebody to whom I am called even, you know, potentially to lay down my life, but rather what is it that I can get from them? The number one thing that I think turns people into a commodity and even the human body into a commodity. You know what it is? Porn. Porn is all about that. It isn't about a person and a relationship. It is all about gratifying my desires in my way. And it's all about me, myself, and I. And if you want to bring toxicity into a marriage relationship or a dating relationship, or you're not even there yet, but you're headed in that direction, it will bring relational poison with you. And the statistics in our day are staggering. And guys, and I know it's an issue for women too, and by the way, it's growing faster with women than it is right now, but it's been high with men for a long time. Get the porn out of your life. And if you can't do it on your own, get some help. Every Tuesday night, there's something that meets here. It's called Celebrate Recovery. It's not just for that, but it certainly includes that. And if you want to journey with people who are trying to go in that same direction, there's a safe place to do that. We're not here to shame you or condemn you. We're here to help you follow Jesus. And so whatever we can do to help in that direction, that is what we will do. But get that toxicity out of your relationship. It will not produce anything positive. It turns people into a commodity. How handsome you are, my beloved. 
and how charming, and her bed is verdant or green, they're outside, the beams of our house are cedars, our rafters are firs. She's talking about his home, that means that he's creating um, a life for himself and an opportunity to invite somebody into that life. So guys, if you're living in your mom's basement playing PlayStation instead of going to work, and you wonder, why is God not bringing somebody my way? It could well be that you're not ready for that. So go to work, don't go to fun, and get up and begin to move in a direction that takes you to the place where you can ultimately invite somebody else into your life. Now some people might go, hey, the Beatles said, all you need is love. You know they broke up, right? I mean, they didn't stay together. Maybe we need a little bit more than love, right? And so maybe there's, you know, a depth and a scope to our relationships beyond that. I am a Rosa Sharon, a lily of the valleys. You see how she's now beginning to talk about herself in more positive ways than she did before. Um, like a lily among thorns is my darling among the young women. All the rest of the women are thorns. You are the flower. Like an apple tree among the trees in the forest is my beloved among the young men. I delight to sit in his shade and his fruit is sweet to my taste. What is that imagery about? In the Bible, over and over again, when it talks about shade, it's talking about being in a place of protection, security, and safety. And the fruit on the tree is talking about how he is life-giving to her and how that relationship is breathing life into them. And we find consistently that he's going to talk about her in exclusive kind of ways. And I think this means, guys, if you are married, sometimes guys will talk about, hey, what's your type, right? Your type of woman. You know what your type is if you're married? It's your wife's type. So for me, that's a five foot three brunette who used to play volleyball back in the day that I met on a bus going to a tournament. That's my type. And your type is your wife. And speak consistently kindly to her and there needs to be this creation of protection and that means from other people but also potentially from you god forbid that you would speak the kind of words that would create not safety but the opposite of that and maybe there's an opportunity if that's been the case to lead out by saying i'm sorry and to put a stake in the ground and say it's going to be different with god's help it's going to be different. Let him lead me to the banquet hall. Let his banner over me be love. This banner is a military term. You know, when they went into battle in the old days, you know, there were just two lines and they'd come together and it was chaos and you didn't know who was on which side. And if you got lost in the middle of battle and you wanted to know where are our troops and where is our group, you could look up and somebody be holding up this banner in the middle of the battle and you could regroup and go there. But he's talking about being proud of her in public and who they are in public and who they are in private is no different. And so this is a call that, hey, there are no friends with benefits, no undercover lovers, no we're married in our heart, there's no such thing. Um, being married in your heart means I really like you but I'm leaving my options open. Um, we're called to make a commitment and to be involved in a process that leads us somewhere ultimately. What is this all talking about? It's talking about cultivating the relationship. Subdue and cultivate. Are you bringing life? Are you bringing the shade that is protection and security? Are you consistently speaking kindly, continuing to pursue even after you've said, I do? And then they go on. Strengthen me with raisins, refresh me with apples, for I am faint with love. His left arm is under my head and his right arm embraces me. Daughters of Jerusalem, I charge you by the gazelles and does of the field. Do not arouse or awaken love until it so desires. The raisins and apple part in the ancient world, there was this belief that uh, fruit that had a lot of seeds in it was an aphrodisiac. And so it's talking about a relationship going in a direction. But do you notice what it says? We have set some boundaries for ourselves physically. You don't see a sexual component to their relationship until they are married to one another. And not only have they set that relationship, he has set that relationship. Listen, my beloved, look here. He comes leaping across the mountains, bounding over the hills. My beloved is like a gazelle or a young stag. Look, there he stands behind our wall, gazing through the windows. This is not a voyeuristic kind of thing here. This is just a way of expressing uh, his attraction to her. Peering through the lattice, my beloved spoke to me and said, Arise, my darling, my beautiful one, come with me. See, the winter has passed, the rains are over and gone. Flowers appear on the earth, the seasons of singing have come. 
The cooing of doves is, is heard in our land. The fig tree forms its early fruit. Springtime, everything's spring into life. Their relationship is coming to life. The blossoming vines spread their fragrance. Arise, come my darling, my beautiful one, come with me. My dove in the, is in the cleft of the rock and the hiding places on the mountainside. Show me your face, let me hear your voice for your voice is sweet and your face is lovely. What is all of that talking about? In the middle of attraction, in the middle of romance, in, in the middle of being drawn to one another, you know what they've done? They have set the sexual boundaries. Is God pro-sex? The answer is yes, he created it. But the issue that often becomes a reality for us is where's the line and when is the time? And the Bible takes us in the direction of saying that that time is in the confines of a relationship called marriage between one man and one woman. And when we cross that line too soon, you know what often happens? We get blinded to some of the realities about the relationship and we don't see other things that we should see. And if we think that sex is just bodies and biology, the Bible says, no, it's not. There's something spiritual and so much deeper going on there. And our body is making a promise that our heart and mind has no intention of keeping. And all that does is cause us to wind up in chaos and confusion. And so set the boundaries. And guys, you set the boundary. Set the boundary to honor God with where he has placed those. And honor him in doing that. Bible says we can even honor God with our bodies, not just about a spiritual thing, that we can honor God with all of life. One more thing, and we're not going to talk about this because we're going to spend a whole week on this. Catch it uh, for us. The foxes, the little foxes that ruin the vineyards are vineyards that are in bloom. This is a way of picturing foxes are not a good thing in the vineyard. They cause a lot of problems. This is the way that they talk about conflict. How amazing is this? And how much does God know about the realities of the human experience? He gave us one chapter on the honeymoon. He gave us two chapters on conflict. How much does God know about reality? But guys, it's an opportunity to lead through conflict. So how do we wrap this all up and how do we understand this and being a man in this day, in this cultural moment that honors God in our relationships? Let me ask you this question. Are you looking for the right one or are you becoming the right one? It's easy for us to think, well, there's an attractive person. I wonder what it would be like to go out with them. It's so much harder to turn in our own direction and say, who am I becoming? And who is God calling me to be as a man? The way that I heard it put online, I don't know who said this first, but it's very catchy. Become the person that the person you're looking for is looking for. Are you becoming? And many times we're looking, but maybe we're not changing. And the call here is for us to move in God's direction. Now here's the thing, again, we're not here to shame you, we're not here to condemn you. As I was going through this and putting these characteristics together, here was my takeaway. I'm not who I wanna be in any of those things. But boy, do I want to move in that direction. And if you're in the same place, I invite you. This isn't about, you know, feeling bad. This is more about where we're going and how we can walk there together. So I'm going to invite you to do something. I'm going to invite you to bow your heads. And we don't do this often, but I think sometimes responding and committing um, just helps commitments to be cemented in us. And so, men, if you want to commit yourself to this direction, to be a man in this day and time who honors God in the area of romance, dating, engagement, marriage, and all that comes along with it, and maybe you recognize, you know, that you fall short, I want to pray for you in just a moment because I think it's a challenging day. It's a day in which Homer Simpson, you know, has kind of come to represent, you know, who men are and they're not, they're not that bright. Well, God has a different take on all that. And there's a different opportunity for us to become something altogether different. So in your heart, if you want to take a step of commitment in that direction, I'm going to ask you to 
to do something. I'm going to ask you to stand up out of your seat. Just stand up, and I'm going to pray for you in just a moment. So go ahead. If you're a man and you want to take that step, you want to commit yourself to direction in which God wants to take you, would you stand? I'm standing with you. And if there's a guy standing around you, the rest of you stand up and maybe put a hand on his shoulder. It's just a sign of encouragement and support. Lord Jesus, we thank you for the direction you give us, coming from the heart, motivated by love and a desire to lead us toward more and more life found together with you. And God, thank you for giving us direction. And God, we recognize it's not always easy. We live at a time where the cultural stream is not always swimming in the same direction that you are, but God, give us courage in this day to walk with you, to seek to honor you, and God, just to experience what is found only as we journey together with you. And so God, for all of us men who are standing, God, would you help us to put a stake in the ground to say, I want to be a man that follows after Jesus, who loves Jesus, and who loves the people in my life and perhaps even by the gift of God, one special person that you have entrusted to us. And God, lead us in that direction for your name's sake. And thank you for so much grace and patience along the way. And we ask and pray all of this in Jesus' name, amen. We hope you enjoyed today's message. If you found this sermon meaningful, please subscribe, rate, and leave a review. Your support helps us reach more people and spread the word. Stay connected with us throughout the week by following us on social media at Washington Heights Church on Facebook and Instagram and by visiting our website at whc.faith. For more information and additional resources, check out the podcast description below. Thank you for joining us. See you next week.